amazing stuff. And it's essential for life. Did you know that your body is made up of between 67 and 75 percent water? Now that's significant because those properties of water are now going to apply to your body. So just like it takes water a long time to cool down and a long time to heat up, it takes your body a long time to cool down and a long time to heat up. Let's see how long it takes to heat up 100 milliliters of water. That is one way that the body maintains your temperature because it's made of so much water it's hard to heat it up and it's hard to cool it down now we call that heat capacity you put uh, ramen noodles on the stove in the water you're waiting for it to boil you're waiting 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 waiting, 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 waiting. finally it boils it takes a long time because that water is absorbing a lot of that heat it has a high heat capacity or you get uh, some hot chocolate at a football game and you're sipping your hot chocolate and it stays hot for a long time. It takes a long time for it to cool down because of that heat capacity. In a similar way, your body takes a long time to heat up and your body takes a long time to cool down. Water also has a high vaporization temperature. That means to go from liquid to vapor, it takes a, a lot of heat energy. So when you're sweaty and you're working out and you're sweaty, for that sweat to evaporate, it's going to take a lot of heat. In order for that sweat to go from liquid to vapor, it's going to take a lot of that heat energy from your body away and that's going to help cool you down. So sweat puts water on the surface of your body, but then for that water to go from liquid to vapor, it's going to take a lot of heat energy, and that's going to cool you down dramatically, which is why sometimes you see little kids at the swimming pool, and that water that made their body wet is now evaporating in the sunshine, and they're standing in line at the concession stand, shivering like this, asking for a popsicle, because all that water is evaporating, taking a lot of their body heat with it. Water is also a solvent. That means it dissolves things. So if I take some salt here, sodium chloride, and I put a little bit in the water, and I stir it up, what's going to happen to those salt crystals? Well, they're going to dissolve in the water. You won't be able to see them anymore. The water is a solvent. That means it dissolves things. The salt is the solute. That's what's being dissolved. And altogether this now is a solution, a saline solution, a solution of salt mixed in the water. Now salt isn't the only thing that water dissolves. Water is considered the universal solvent. It dissolves lots of things. When it does, it splits those atoms that it was holding together with chemical bonds. That's significant because that's how we get pH. Acids are different than bases because when they are dissolved in water, acids will release a hydrogen ion. A base will release an OH ion, a hydroxide ion. So whenever we put an acid into water, if it releases a hydrogen, it's an acid. We put a solution into the water, if it releases an OH, it's a base. So acids release hydrogen ions, bases release hydroxide ions. Water dissolves things. Acids and bases are broken down into water. And as the acid and the base dissolves, the hydrogen ions are released if it's an acid. The OH ions are released if it's a base. So let's take a look at some items that I have here and what we could do to see if they're an acid or a base. pH scale is a measure of how strong the acid is or how strong the base is. Remember that atoms bond for chemical stability. So a hydrogen ion, that's one proton, 
no electrons, is looking for electrons to fill that outer energy level. And it will do terrible, violent things in order to get the stability of those two electrons in that first level. So if there's lots of hydrogen ions floating around in the solution, then the reactions get more violent, the acid is stronger. We measure that on the pH scale as zeros and ones, low numbers on the pH scale. If it's a hydroxide ion, that OH is looking for an extra electron. And it's going to do violent things to get it. So the more hydroxide ions are in that solution, the stronger the base. 14 is the strongest base. So the scale goes from 0 to 14. 7 is right in the middle. Because on 7, we have the same number of hydrogen ions as we do hydroxide. So we've got H and OH. So if I have two H's and one O, that makes water. So water is seven, right in the middle. It's neither an acid or base because it's even, neutral. Water dissolves things. When acids dissolve in water, the hydrogen is released, making the solution acidic. When bases are dissolved in water, the OHs are released, making the solution basic. I have here some indicator solution. Normally, it's green. The indicator solution changes color based on whether it's mixing with an acid or a base. So if I were to take some soda and pour the soda into the solution, I would expect the color to change to look more acidic. The pH scale is a logarithmic scale. That means when I go from 7 to 6, I've increased the acidity 10 times. When I go from 7 to 5, I've increased the acidity 100 times. When I go from 7 to 6 to 5 to 4, I've increased the acidity 1,000 times. That's a really strong acid or base. Here I have some alka sulfur. Let's say that my stomach is upset and I would like an alka sulfur tablet. If I put this tablet into the solution, would I expect it to be acidic or basic? So the question is, what will an acid do in water? And the answer is simple. It's going to lose a hydrogen. In this container, I've crushed some aspirin. If I take aspirin for my headache, is it going to turn my indicator solution an uh, acidic color or a basic color? This is an example of a pH scale. Notice that it goes from 0 at the top to 14 at the bottom. 7 pure water right in the middle. Then I have some Clorox cleanup solution. As I spray this into my indicator solution, will it turn to be a more acidic color or a more basic one? Notice that we have the logarithmic scale here. We're measuring the concentration of hydrogen ions as we go lower in the pH numbers. And as we go higher in the pH numbers, we're measuring the concentration of the hydroxide ions. The OHs. So down here are really strong bases, up here really strong acids. Notice where something like soda is. A pH of 3, that's a fairly strong acid, which is why it does things like clean your pennies. Notice that oven cleaner down here, a 13, a very strong base, which is why you should wear gloves whenever you're cleaning your oven and spraying on the oven cleaner. Our body, the human body, tends to use weak acids. Because whenever a weak acid like carbonic acid or vinegar is ionized, whenever it becomes or gives off the hydrogen or the OH or the hydroxide, we can manage that. It's not too dramatic, it's not too strong, it's not too violent for our body and the cells preserving those chemical bonds. So strong acids for our body is too big. It would do too much damage. If you were to drink hydrochloric acid, it would do a lot of damage. 
If you were to even touch hydrochloric acid, it would do a lot of damage. It's too strong. So having it in your body is too strong. Water, like weak acids, it's not enough. Like doesn't nothing happens. There's not enough ionization. There's not enough of those chemical reactions going on. So we use weak acids typically, like carbonic acid. If we mix carbon dioxide with water, we get carbonic acid. Or like things like vinegar, low pH levels, um, mild pH levels, not very acidic, not very basic. It keeps our body pretty much in that normal range. A change from a pH of 7.4 to a pH of 8.4 is an increase of, I remember it's a logarithmic scale. That means it's increasing in powers of 10. So in that case, it's an increase in power of 10. Molly is breathing rapidly and deeply when she arrives at the emergency room, despite being normally comatose. So if a little girl has ingested too much aspirin, let's say, aspirin is an acid, so the pH level of her blood is going to drop, how's her body going to get rid of that? Well, the easiest way is to try to get rid of the carbon dioxide, because carbon dioxide makes carbonic acid when it's mixed with water. So by breathing out a lot of carbon dioxide, we can help raise the pH back to the normal 7.4 that blood happens to be. I have here some universal indicator solution mixed with water. As I exhale into this solution, if my carbon dioxide mixes with the water to make an acid, it'll turn red, orange, yellow. If it makes a base, it'll turn blue, green, purple. So let's see what happens. There, weak carbonic acid. The question here is what do buffers do? So in the human body, to keep the acids from swinging too far one way or the bases swinging too far the other, buffers help keep all those pH reactions in a pretty narrow range, close to seven. Weak acids and weak bases, but close to seven. Somewhere in this narrow range, close to neutral. So if we take carbon dioxide, we mix it with water, that's going to lower the pH because it's going to make carbonic acid. If we add a buffer like bicarbonate, it'll take longer to make that carbonic acid because the bicarbonate is going to take up some of these extra loose hydrogen ions that make it acidic. So we can raise the pH by adding bicarbonate or we can lower the pH by adding carbon dioxide. So more carbon dioxide will drive the reaction this way to be more acidic. More bicarbonate will collect those hydrogen ions and drive the reaction this way more basic. Why is buffering so important then? Why is it so important to humans? Because when we're outside of those narrow ranges of normal pH levels, bad things start to happen. It's too violent. The reactions are too violent for our cells to survive. So a buffer is going to help maintain that normal low levels of pH close to neutral, not violently basic, not incredibly acidic, just right in that normal level. Take the case of your stomach acid. Your stomach acid is close to hydrochloric acid, pH of 1. Right beside it, though, in your small intestine, if we were to test what just came out of your stomach, pH of 7. Now, how do you go from 1 to close to 7 in a very short distance? What happens there? Well, one of the functions of the pancreas is to release some bicarbonate buffers so that that buffer uh, will help um, neutralize that pH so it won't be quite so strong when it comes into your uh, small intestine. That way you won't get small intestine ulcers, duodenal ulcers.